Well, we're going to continue this morning speaking of faith. And we, we just completed up Hebrews chapter 11 last week. Hebrews chapter 11 highlights the faith of some of the Old Testament heroes. And it actually highlights the deeds that they did by faith. And we're going to get into chapter 12 because it's a continuation. If you did not know this, the Bible was not originally written in scriptures as far as chapter numbers and verses. It was written, written as letters. So this letter to the Hebrews was one long letter. And then the translators, to put it in modern translations, pick places that they believe that the break of thought should be, and they put in their verses. And they did a really good job when you read it over. There are some places you can tell they messed up and uh, put a, they ended a chapter when they should have continued. But chapter 12 is simply a continuation of chapter 11. And we've really been, and today we're going to finish up this message, uh, this series on faith. Um, but we'll never quit preaching on faith because it's by faith you're saved. Amen. It's by faith, through grace, or by grace through faith, I'm sorry. It's through faith. Faith is the, is the channel. That's how Lane gave his heart to Jesus Christ. He put faith in the work of Jesus Christ. His life was changed. If you're born again today, that's how it happened. If you're not born again today, what do you mean born again? If you're not a child of God, been, being born of his spirit, then you can be. And you, you are uh, born again by placing your faith in the work of Jesus Christ and putting faith in him. I spent years trying to build faith up in myself, and I just kept failing myself. Well, let's go right into verse 1 of chapter 12. Therefore, in other words, just read, let's pretend we just read all of 11. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, it's talking about the Old Testament witnesses, to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Now, we're going to just break into this scripture. We can go back to the first part of it, and we're going to learn something today. We all know, everyone in here, if you're a believer, you know that God has called you and prepared you to live a life of faith. Over and over in the scriptures, it says this, the just shall live by faith. Let's say, let's say it together. The just shall live by faith. This is the lifeblood of the believer is faith. And that's why you should never get on someone and go, all oh, they ever talk about is faith. Listen, really all that matters is faith. Because everything God has done for us is inaccessible except by faith. It's all good. The cross, wonderful. Forgiveness, forgiveness of sin, phenomenal, right? The gift of the Holy Spirit, powerful. The gift of love, man, there's no words for it. All these things God's given us are wonderful, but when you take faith out of the equation, none of them are accessible at all. This is why when you were not children of God, you were strangers to the promises. You were strangers to the relationship. You could only see others in that relationship. How many of you remember before you were saved, seeing other people in a relationship with God, and you thought, wow, I would like to have that one day. You remember thinking that? They're such a good person. You know, they really walk the walk. Uh, whatever they say, they do. Those kind of people stick out in your mind. Well, the only way they were able to do that is by faith. And the only reason you were unable to do it was because you did not have faith faith in Christ. So faith is not just an important issue. Faith is the main issue when it comes to receiving from God. Now God's will is for us to receive from Him. How many of you know that? That is the will of the Father, that you would receive from Him. That's what makes Him happy. That's why He sent His Son Jesus. He didn't send His Son Jesus to earth just to pay for our sins. He sent Him to pay for our sins so that we could receive forgiveness of sin is so that we could receive from God what God wants to give us. Remember Jesus would say this often to his disciples. He would say things like, why do you have such little faith? Remember that? He would say, why is your faith so small? It depends on what translation. Where is your faith? If you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, and if you have faith, and 
You need faith. And he just goes on and on. And then you read the book of John and over and over he's saying, believe in me. What's another translation? Have faith in me. Why is it Jesus was so hardcore about their faith? You could say it like this. Really, this is what Jesus was saying to them. Why do you refuse to receive what I have to give? Because that's what faith does, right? Faith receives from God what he has. He said, why do you neglect what I'm giving you? Why do you turn away from the blessing? You see, we don't see it that way in these natural eyes when we're not walking by faith. When we're not walking by faith, then we have turned our back on the blessing. Come on now. And we turn our back on the blessing, then we're depending on the human strength to accomplish everything that we want in life. We want happiness. That's, God has given us a desire to be happy. But when you think your happiness is dependent on how you're being treated by others, then your happiness will be short-lived, right? We all know that. Because how many of you love someone deeply? How many of you? Come on, raise your hand. You love someone deeply. How many have been hurt by that same person you love deeply? All right. Okay, so we know just from human experience that it is not enough just to have good intentions or just, or just to have love we must have something deeper. We must have something that drives us on the inside that connects us to an unchanging, immovable love that never changes. So that as we learn to live by faith, we connect ourselves to that Spirit of God that gives us self-worth, gives us happiness, gives us satisfaction. God wants you happy. I know there are preachers that will stand up and tell you, God is not interested in your happiness. Trust me, God wants you happy. He's just not interested in making you happy by things that don't come from Him. He wants to make you happy with what He has to offer. Just like our brother said up here earlier, all the things of the world, when he traded out the things of the world and the things he was pursuing to find happiness, peace, to find all these things in his life, and he decided to turn to God, he lost nothing. He only gained. Even as believers, we never lose when we place our faith in God. And as believers, we turn our back sometimes and we don't put our faith in God in certain areas of our life. Now, for most of us, we have no problem with our salvation. Amen? We know we're saved. And if I tried to, you know, if, if someone at work tried to convince you you weren't saved, they'd have, they, they would just have their hands full, right? But now you let that same person start trying to tell you you're not blessed and it might not be so difficult of a battle. Because they'll say, well, if you were blessed, you'd have this. If you were blessed, you'd do that. Right? Well, if you were blessed, why are you in debt? If you're blessed, why are you struggling to make your house payment? Well, how do I answer that? The same way I answer, if I'm saved, how come I still sin? Come on now. If I'm saved, how come there's still things that pop every once in a while? Because you're saved. Because just because God has provided something does not necessarily mean I'm walking in it. That's why. I've been given perfection in Christ. Amen. We've all been given perfection. But we can choose to walk in it. The Bible says it like this. Walk in the Spirit, and you'll obey the Spirit. Walk in the flesh, and you'll obey the flesh. In other words, life, as a believer, you can walk in life, which is listening to the Lord, following the voice of God, and it'll always produce life. But as a Christian, you can also walk in the flesh. Some of y'all might have walked in here this morning in the flesh. I don't know. When you walk in the flesh, what comes? Death comes. Amen. That's what comes when you walk in the flesh. Does that have anything to do with your security in Christ Jesus? Does that have anything to do with you being God's child? Absolutely nothing to do with your relationship with God. But it has everything to do with you finding happiness. You finding joy. Lane, let me ask you a question. Have you ever questioned that this boy is your God-given son? And Have you ever questioned your love for him? Has that ever been a question? Absolutely not. But has this boy ever hurt you? Absolutely. So, see, it's the same way in our relationship with God. God's love never changes. God's commitment to us, when we're in failure, grows. And I know my brother experienced that. As he saw his son going downhill, what happened? His love grew in him. Your love doesn't go away when your children fail. Your love is magnified. Well, I don't think God can bless me. I had someone ask me the other day, can God bless me if I did something wrong? Well, let me ask you this question. If your child did something wrong and decided to go live some lifestyle that was the opposite of what that you know that you've taught them to do 
and you know God's called them to do. If they decide to just go be a street person and, and just and, and steal and do drugs, if they call you one day and said, I need a sandwich, are you going to say, you know what? You ain't living right. I'm not bringing you a sandwich. No, listen, you'll do without as a parent. If you wouldn't, you're not worth your salt. As a parent, you will load yourself, you will take your food out of your mouth Amen? Y'all parents know what I'm talking about. And you will give it to that child. You will starve to death so your child will live. It's the love of a parent. Now you tell me how religion has got this thing so messed up that they believe that God is better than humans. That God treats his children in a different manner than humans treat theirs. That God will say, no, you messed up, so I'm not going to bless you. You messed up, so I'm not going to feed you. Oh, you didn't do this, so I'm not going to do that. That's not the way God operates. But listen, just because you take that child a ham sandwich on the street of Lakeland does not mean you approve of their lifestyle. Come on now. You don't starve your children when they disobey. You don't say, you know what? You, you, you lied so you don't eat for a week. You shouldn't ever take a meal from them. I know people say, send them to bed without food. That's wrong. And I know you may have done it. It's wrong. That's not the way you discipline people. By starving them. Number one, it gives them a bad idea about who God is. They have to face consequences, absolutely, but you don't take away their security, you don't take away their provision. Come on now. I'm preaching, y'all. And I ain't even got started. That was just a precursor to the message. So faith is important. Faith is necessary. Faith is the top of the list on God's three things. Or it's in the top three. It is the top, actually. These three things endure. What are they? Faith. Hope. Love. Faith, hope, and love. Without faith, there's no hope. Without faith, there's no love. Faith must be. That's why we probably every year should spend about three months dealing with faith. And if you missed out on the last four months of faith teachings, the good news is you can go to YouTube and you can pull it up and you can... Watch it, or you can go to iTunes on our website, and you can listen to all of them. You can download them on your devices, and you can listen to them. We need, this is a, these messages are not just me seeking out, oh God, what am I going to do Sunday? These are directives from the Holy Spirit for the church here at Victory Worship Center for the family. So when you miss a week, you need to get online, ask for a CD. If you cannot get online, and we'll make you a CD or a DVD. Because it's important. Faith is important. Now, we know what we're supposed to do, amen? How many of you, it's not a problem not knowing what to do. We know what to do as believers. That's why I don't stand up here and tell you everything you're doing wrong every week because most of us already know it. But knowing what to do is not knowledge of how to do it. I know what to do. Sometimes I have a hard time doing it. Sometimes I just don't want to do it. And other times I'm not real sure how to do it. I used to have a real bad anger problem. Whoever had one of them before? Terrible anger. And, and I, I was dangerously angry. It's a, it's a, it was only by the grace of God that I'm not sitting in a prison today for murder. That's how angry I would get at people. That's not, that's not kidding. I actually was intending on killing someone one time because I saw them abusing someone I loved. And I literally went and got my gun to kill them when I was 17 years old. And they ran. As long as they didn't die, they took off. Now, that was my anger at what they were doing, spurned by the love I had for the person they were abusing, but it was still my anger. And I was not being threatened, so I would have probably ended up in jail over it. Especially because I would have shot him in the back if I could have got it, if I could have. It didn't matter. I was that, that was what kind of anger that controlled me. When I got saved, I, I lost that, I lost that old nature and gained a brand new nature, but I found out that if you push the right buttons, I could do a memory recall pretty quick and I could pull up my anger pretty quick. And I didn't know what to do about it. I knew it wasn't right. I knew it wasn't right to jump all over my wife if she just did, you know, she'd have to walk around eggshells with me after I was saved. You know, I mean, I could say all kinds of things, expect her just to absorb it. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. But if she said it, whoa, wait a minute. Everything was questioning my authority, questioning everything and what right. And I honestly did not know what to do with it. I did not know how to contain it. And it was only the wisdom of God that came that taught me how to productively live out a life being a calm person, not losing my temper. Garrett can tell you, our 20-year-old, 
he can tell you that the marriage we have today is in contrast far different than the marriage when he was a little boy growing up. We loved God. I loved God. I never missed a day of church unless I was sick or working. And he didn't either. And I didn't make him go. He cried to go. They all do. I never make my kids go to church. But I'll tell you this much. Whenever the Lord began to awaken a know-how of how to do some things in my spiritual life, my anger issues started coming down. I started walking in victory over them. And that's what God wants for you to do. He wants you to walk in victory over everything in your life that is a problem. We've been called to live in victory. In fact, the scripture says, whoever receives an abundance of grace will reign in this life through Jesus Christ. If life is ruling over you, i got good news for you today. You can turn the tables and you can reign in your life. God wants you to be in charge of your life. He wants you to make the calls. He wants you to decide your directives, not your circumstances. Amen? This only comes by faith. So we get here a lesson on how to live by faith. And this is the first thing he says. The first thing we want to do is strip off every weight that slows us down. These weights that slows us down, simply put, are ways of thinking. That's what gets in our way. That's what pulls us down, is the way we think. We're to be renewed in our minds. How? By the Word of God. We're to spend time with the Lord not to get brownie points with God so we get to go to heaven. We're to spend time with the Lord so that our mind can be renewed. That's why it's important to be in the church. It's important to be under the correct teaching. It's important to have a daily walk with God. Not so God will mark his approval on you. My friend, that was accomplished on the cross. Do you understand that? You were approved on the day Jesus died for you. That's when your approval came. What this brings about, these disciplines, these Christian disciplines, what they bring about is growth. And that's what the church of Jesus Christ needs is to grow up. To grow in our faith. To grow and become less uh, dependent upon human beings and more dependent upon Jesus Christ. This is what we need to be reaching toward. And that's why we need to lay aside those old ways of thinking. This family's done that as they talked about their ways of thinking. It used to be, let's gain the world. But the Bible says, what profiteth a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? And that's what happened to them. That's what happened to all of us. Unless we just grew up knowing and trusting in Christ, which there's a few that have. Thank God for that. I've had people say to me, well, I don't have much of a testimony. I've trusted God my whole life. That's the greatest testimony there is. Did you hear this man say, I regret wasted years. I wish I'd have done it sooner. If he could back up the clock, he would have started at 10 years old serving God and raised his family totally different. Amen? That's a testimony. Yeah, God did a wonderful thing. Yeah, God can pick up broken pieces. But more importantly is God can keep you from ever being broken. But only if you have a life of faith. And so many times we as Christians live such broken lives that we don't have time to work with anybody else because we're patching our own problems. People need help from us. And the strong are called to help the weak but the church, if she's weak, yes, the church can be weak. I love the church. The church is the born-again body of God, but they can be weak. And they, I know. I've been weak. I know what it's like. But now God hasn't called you to be weak. And don't ever let the devil lie to you and say, well, you're not called into ministry. No, you were called into ministry, my friend. If you were born again, you've been given, Paul said, a ministry of reconciliation. Reconciling the world to God because God has already reconciled himself to the world God's already opened the gateway and our job as believers is to lead other people to Jesus that's your calling you could have been uh, you could have been neglecting this call you may continue neglecting it but it will not change that's your calling reaching people for Jesus in every way possible let everything you do do as unto the Lord whether it be a missions trip or a trip down to the Circle K to get a soda at the fountain and see a need and meet the need and pray with somebody you know, as a police officer, I spent hours and hours praying with people. And what is interesting, is even though I was carrying that authority, and I was, had people in the back of my car many times apart from their will, in seven years, I only had two people ever deny me prayer. And I prayed literally, I'm guessing hundreds, continually. I would run into young men with the same kind of problems Ryan had, and I'd say, man, I know God can change your life. You mind if I pray with you? 
If I couldn't lead them to the Lord, I'd at least pray for them. And I would always say this, and this is a good idea, God, show yourself to this young man. Show your, show your love. Prove who you are. Convince them of the realities of God. I would always do that. Most people, I'd say 99% of the people, 99% of the time, will welcome you to pray for them. But have you been doing it? I mean, have you been fulfilling the call? Well, if you haven't, there's only two reasons. One, you're either afraid to, or two, you haven't been equipped to. You haven't grown in your faith. And that's what we need to do. We need to strip off the weight. That weight that says, what are they going to think about me? What are they going to say about me? You know what? What are they going to think about you and say about you when they're put in hell and they find out you aren't there? I mean, let's be more concerned about what's going to happen in eternity than what happens here. There's nothing grander than being abused for righteousness' sake. There's nothing greater than persecution for righteousness. But most of the times we're persecuted for our own failures and we call it persecution. That's not true persecution. Persecution is when people look at you and laugh at you because you believe in God. That's persecution. You know what you should do when they do that? You should go, oh, great, it's my reward in heaven. Great. The more persecuted you are by people, the more, the more people that turn you down and laugh at you, the greater the glory God will share with you. So shouldn't that embolden us to be a little more active in our testimony and in our witness with people? So we have to change. We have to strip off the weights that slow us down, those ways of thinking that hinder us from fulfilling God's call in our life because let's face it, the reality is you are not called. I want everybody to listen to this. You are not called to live a good life, make money, retire, take it easy, relax, and die. You're called to bring glory to God in the earth. And if you're not doing that, you're missing out on the greatest joy that exists. The joy of service to a king. So let's strip off every weight that slows us down. Remember, that's mindsets. And now look at the next thing. It says, and especially the sin that so easily trips us up. How many of you right now could say, Pastor Tim, I know the sin that easily trips me up. Let me see your hand. Let me see your hand. I know the one that easily, the one I fail, the one I mess up. Okay, the ones that can't think of one, I'll give you one real quick. Pride, that's the one you got. <laughs> because if you can't think of something that you struggle with, then I will help you identify. And there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with you struggling with pride any more is there someone struggling with lust. There's nothing wrong with it. But the fact is you need to know something. You don't have your glorified body yet. Yeah. You are still a person trapped inside a sinful body. And that body does not want to line up with the Word of God, and it will not line up totally and completely until you've received your new one. So if you can't think of something that kind of is your weakness, pride is your weakness. I have, to, I have to make sure people know that. And then begin to ask God, okay, God, show me then. Show me. Show me my pride. Because I don't want it. I don't want pride. Pride hinders God's blessing from flowing in our life. Because pride is, look what I've done. And we say, look what I've done. We've taken our eyes off what he's done. And we've done that, then there's no faith active. Faith is only active when it's active in Christ Jesus. If we're just trusting ourselves, that's not faith. That's a lie. Actually, you know what? It's self-deception. I think Peter said it like this. To be hearers of the word and not doers, you're deceiving yourself. To be hearers of the word, to know the word and not be active in it in every area of your life, every area is self-deception. Because in our minds, because we know it, it's good enough. Listen, no one's not good enough. Knowing you're a sinner is not getting you into heaven. How many of y'all know that? Knowing it is not good enough. Knowing God is good is not going to get the blessing flowing in your life. Knowing healing is for today is not going to get you cured of cancer. Knowing God's will for you is prosperity is not going to get you out of the dump. It's acting on what you know. It's being doers of the word. I want to ask this question. Can you think anywhere in your life that you could be a better doer of the word? Let me see a hand for that. A better doer of the word. Absolutely. There's no way. Man, the only person who could raise their hand and say, and say nah, I really can't think of anything would be Jesus himself. <laughs> and you're not him. <laughs> You're in him, but you're not him. But you know what? One day, we're going to be just like him. 
Right now our insides are like him. Eventually our outside is going to be like him. How many of you looking forward to that day? Don't miss next week when we start talking about heaven. Don't miss it. You're going to learn that we're not just going to go live. How many of y'all thought we are just going to go live in heaven forever? Let me see your hand. You thought we are going to heaven? Live forever. Oh, wow, y'all are pretty up to date. Now a few of you thought that. I'll show you that we're coming back to earth in these teachings. We're coming back. You're going to live here minus pain, corruption, trouble, temperature that burns your skin. Amen. Glory to God. Good food that don't make you fat. You're going to look good. Hey, you want that body you always wanted? You're going to have it. And you won't have to go to a gym to get it. Some Y'all women should be like, praise God. We don't, see, we don't think about that enough, do we? Perfect. What you see in television and on the screens today will be paled in comparison to a new human being with a brand new body in Christ with glorified, glorified glory. The glory of God running through the human veins instead of blood. You're going to look good. Glory to God. I'm almost done preaching. I just quit right there. I can tell you why some, some of us don't look so good. Y'all, anybody ever wonder why some people ain't so good looking as others? I mean, let's just admit it. Some people are good looking. Amen? Let's just admit it. Some people, when you just look at them, they're like, man, they got it made. And you're there, you see them down at the donut place eating donuts, ordering pizza, drinking Coke, some supersized Coke they outlawed in New York. Just, and they look great. Y'all know anybody like that? There's like one in a million, I think, something like that. They always make it to Hollywood. There's some of them there that actually work for their bodies, but there's some that just, you know, DNA is a funny thing. Genetics. And they just, they just got that. But let me tell you something. When you get your new body, they will be jealous of you. You ain't seen beautiful yet. To you. you know, the first, the first beautiful thing you're going to see when you die is Jesus himself. Because he's got a glorified body right now in heaven. You're going to look at him and go, good. You're going to fall down at the beauty of the Son of God. And i got news for you. The scripture says when he was on earth, he was nothing to look at. Did you all know that? There was no beauty in him that we would desire him. That's why I said a while back, if Jesus was alive today, if you were alive in the days of Jesus, you'd probably neglect him just like everybody else did. Because when you looked at him, he'd probably look a lot like me. Just with brown eyes instead of blue eyes. This kind of ugly cuss. You know, just not good looking, I should say. I'm not calling the Lord of glory ugly. Don't, don't, I'm not disrespecting Jesus. But the scriptures say there was nothing beautiful about him. But I got news for you. When he got a glorified body, why do you think they didn't recognize him? How many of y'all know when they looked at him, they went, hey, it's the gardener. That's a good looking gardener. That wasn't a gardener. That was Jesus Christ's glorified body. And when you see him, you're going to go, whoa. And you're going to be like him when you get your body. Amen. Yeah, see, now I get an Amen. All sin is going to lose its effect on you. Wrinkles, worry, trouble, heart problems, all gone. What's wrong, Isaac? Is he wanting to come up here? See, he wants to hear the preacher so bad he cries when they take him out. This is going to be good. It's better than we can imagine. Boris said that there's, there's sin that easily trip us up, and I was going somewhere just a moment ago. Oh, yeah, I said, do you know why some people are not as good looking as others? Why most people aren't really good looking? I got the answer. I've studied it for years. <laughs> now I know. I said, God, why didn't you make me good? I had a good friend in high school. When I became friends with him, all the girls liked me. Anybody ever? They just liked me because they thought if they could date me, they might could get to him. <laughs> good looking fella. In fact, my wife went out on a date with him before I started dating her. Isn't that funny? Years later. Years later is when she and I got together. But anyway, this good friend of mine, just a good-looking guy, great personality. You know, just when you looked at him, just like, man, see, it's guys like you that ruin it for guys like me. So I, asked, I kept asking the Lord, why, Lord? Why don't I look like that? And you know what the Lord told me? He said, son, if you'd have looked like him, you'd have already been through seven or eight wives. Come on, because they'd have all been chasing you if you looked like that. But you know what I noticed about my friend? He didn't even pay attention to women. Women chase him, he didn't care. We'd walk in a store, and I don't know if you've ever done this, I would step back and just watch the ladies. And no matter how old they were, you thought only old men looked at young women? That is not true. Them old women can't even hardly walk. <laughs> Looking at him. And I would walk up to him, and I'd say, his name was Paul. I'd say, Paul, do you know that every female and some males in this school, in this, 
in this store are looking at you. He goes, no, they're not. Yes, they are. But he's so used to everyone looking at him that in his mind, everybody's just looking at him. I mean, that's just the way their eyes are going. I don't know. But I was used to coming in and nobody even knew I entered the room. And the Lord said, son, if I'd have made you look like him, you'd have never got married. You'd have been running around with every woman you could find. You'd have been doing what your old flesh wanted to do. And I would have never been able to fulfill my goal for your life. So now I thank God I'm not pretty. <laughs> but I will say, for those of you that have seen my high school pictures, I'm a better looking man than I was youth. For those of you that have seen it. Because I've grown in the Lord, I've learned to resist. And the better I get looking, it's because I got better at resisting. It's just the glory of the Lord, amen? That's no kidding. I'll take you back to some pictures one day. You'll be like, glory to God, he's already been raptured. Look at there. Amen. <laughs> So the sin that easily trips us up, you have authority over it, and you know you do. But you have to deal with it in your thought process first. I found out a little trick about avoiding sin. There's a couple of them I'm going to share with you today. Because most, every Christian I know doesn't want sin in their life. If you like sin, you're not a Christian. Clarify that. If you like sinning and you just want to sin all the time, you're not a Christian. But when you sin, if you were like, man, I shouldn't have done that, then you're most likely a Christian. Because okay? you have a new nature that wants to do the right thing. You feed that old one long enough, it'll eventually make you think you're not saved anymore, but it doesn't change the fact you're saved. There's a couple things you can do, and this is just pastoral counseling time right now. There's a couple things you can do where sin that easily besets you. These are the sins that you keep messing up. Just you know, arguing with your wife, uh, beating your children, um, stealing from your employee, employer, or employee, I guess if you're the boss. That's pretty sad if you're stealing from your employees, by the way. Um, a dishonesty, fear, worry, um, neglecting others, all these things. If, if those are issues you're dealing with, then I can tell you the number one thing that we need to do to overcome those is refuse to think about them anymore. When the thought comes to be offended, immediately do away with it. Because if you don't think about it, you'll never do it. Come on now. If you don't think about the sin, you'll never walk in the sin. Because the enemy has to drop a thought in first. And after he drops the thought, you, you take it like a, a fish takes a hook. And, and then you begin to digest that thought. Say, let's just deal with worry. Because this is what a lot of people deal with. You, you have a financial problem, and the thought comes, I'm not going to be able to pay my bills this month. That's the thought. Now, your job is to reject that thought and say, in the name of Jesus, I reject that thought. I am going to have my needs met because God's my king. And even if I don't pay my bills, God's going to take care of me because God's my king. I'm not, I refuse to worry about it for one moment, okay? That's what you need to do. But if you don't, you start thinking about it. And then all of a sudden, you start remembering bills you hadn't paid in a while. And then you get on the bank account. You start looking everywhere you've been spending your money then you notice you ain't tithed in three months. Then you notice, come on now, you've been eating out, but you ain't been buying groceries for the cupboard. Who's ever done that? Some of you young people know what I'm talking about. And what happens? You get consumed with worry because you took a thought. Jesus said, take no thought. What shall I eat? What shall I drink? How shall I be clothed? Don't take a thought. That's what it says in the King James. Instead, look to your father. He provides for the animals that he loves. How much more will he provide you for your children? Right? So you don't take the thought. But then if you say, and this works particularly well with embarrassing sins. I don't know how many of you have them because you wouldn't raise your hand if you did. But for some of you, you have embarrassing things that you don't want to talk about with nobody. They're embarrassing sins. And they're usually the ones that attack uh, Christians because they're the ones they tend to hide. Hide them away. They don't want anybody to know about them. The scriptures say something interesting. Uh, in fact, I've shared out of it at our men's breakfast this month. It says, confess your faults one to another and be healed, and pray for one another that you may be healed. So I found another key to laying aside things in your life that you don't want, especially embarrassing things. Find someone you trust. Find someone that loves you, that loves God, and confide in them what you're dealing with, and tell them the truth about it. You will not shock them. You will not surprise them. Because people have a lot darker issues than they want to admit. I learned that as a police officer. Darkness invades every family. 
It invades every person at some level. Find someone you can trust. Ask God to show you. You've got pastoral leadership in myself. Uh, You've got other, other people that you can trust that they're not going to go telling everybody. They're not going to embarrass you, and they're going to stand with you. Find someone and share them. This is my issue. This is what I'm facing. And then commit to them, and this is the part that helps you. Commit to them that the very moment you step into that sin realm again, you're going to call them immediately and tell them exactly what you've done. Can I just tell you how much that will help you? Let me tell you what happens. The devil brings a thought for an embarrassing thing, whatever it may be. Maybe, maybe you got problems stealing at work. I don't know. Maybe you add 30 minutes on your pay stub, or on, not your pay stub. You add 30 minutes on your time clock. Maybe, whatever it is, maybe that's what you've been doing, and you just know it's wrong, but you, you just, man, I, I need that extra money. You know, I need it. Find someone, tell them, say, listen, here's the problem. I've been stealing, man. I'm a person, I love God with all my heart, but I cannot, for some reason, I've been a thief. I ain't going to have you raise your hand. Nobody's going to frisk you before we leave. This works in all embarrassing sins, okay? All of them. Find them, tell them, this is what I'm dealing with. And tell them the truth. This is how often I've done it. This is my past in regards to it. And I want you to be someone that I can call the next time I cheat on the time clock. And here's what happens. You're walking out. I mean, I used to do time clocks. You're walking out, and you know, if you don't punch them, you can ride on them. That's how you steal. But you can also have someone else punch it for you. Who's ever done that before? Never mind. Don't raise your hand. You also have someone else punch you, or you can skip out on lunch or whatever. The next time you go to steal from your employee by getting on Facebook instead of working, come on. Somebody laughed. The next time you do that, know that as soon as I do this, I've got to call this person and tell them what I've done. And can I tell you how much that will help you? Not to do it. Because what it does is it kills the thought immediately. And if you kill the thought, you've killed the temptation. If you kill the temptation, you've killed the sin. Okay? Just know in your mind. So I'm helping you. I'm trying to help you. You can be an overcomer by doing these things, by taking care of and stripping off weights and sins that easily trip us up because what they do is they weigh us down and you know we can still go we're still going for God but we're just like under a lot of pressure God wants you to be free not to be embarrassed about your life God wants you to live the kind of life that you'll invite anyone into at any time and let them see anything you're doing saying or watching except for your private time with your spouse. <laughs> That's the kind of life God wants you to have, a light that shines. Amen? Amen? That's the kind of life every believer wants. They don't know secrets. They don't, and I'm telling you, you can overcome this, and these are the ways you do it. Now look at this, the second part of that verse. Now let's get rid of these things, and let us run with endurance the race. Let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. In other words, God has set a pattern, a pathway in front of us, and the only way we will accomplish God's plan is to endure till the end. The Christian life is not an easy life. It is a, it is a challenging life. Now, I don't mean being a Christian is challenging because that's a gift. Okay? But walking it out is challenging. Because you fall. And then when you fall, you beat yourself up. You beat yourself up. You quit doing it. God said, you know what? Keep going. Keep finishing. Keep getting up. And then the last verse tells us how to do all these things. This is where our focus is to be. Let's read this together. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. So where do our eyes stay? On Jesus. Our eyes stay on Jesus because he is the one who started us on this course and he is the one who will complete this in us. I am confident that the Lord who begun the good work in you will complete it. And that's not Pastor Tim speaking. That's the scriptures. That's what Paul said. I am confident that the Lord who started that work in you when you were born again is going to bring it to fruition. And this is how we do it. We keep our eyes on the champion. We're not the champion. He's the champion. And as I close today, it's going to just tie in right into next week's message. Paul said in the book of Colossians, in chapter 3, we're going to be at verse 1. I don't know if they'll get it in time. Paul's writing to the book, or writing to the church. And I believe Paul was the writer of Hebrews. Some people don't. 
But listen what he tells them about living the new life. Colossians 3.1. Since you have been raised to new life, you're going to have to look at me because it's probably not up there. Since you've been raised, not if, not, uh, not uh, to be raised, but because you've been raised to new life with Christ, now set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits at honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in his glory. Paul's saying, since you've been saved, move your eyes up to heaven. Get your eyes on Jesus, because he's the one that's given you the new life. And get your mind thinking about the things of heaven. And that's why we're going to start next week dealing with heaven. Because every problem we have on this earth is located on this earth. Isn't that a nice fact for you? Every problem on earth dwells on earth. But you have no problems in heaven. And your life is in Christ there. It's hidden there. Not hidden from you, hidden for you. So in other words, it's almost like God has this grand plan, but he's taking it to heaven with him. And he said, you want to know what it is? Seek me, you'll find it because it's in me. I want to know my plan, God's plan for my life. Don't go asking a college uh, uh, person, uh, what do you call them, the people who help you in college, find your way. Advisor. Don't go to a college advisor. Go to God. Say, God, what's your plan for my life? It may be a degree in college, but it may not be. Not everyone's called to do it. Seek God. That's what he says. Since you've been raised to life for Christ, set your sights on heaven.